Ashley, you have an incredible story. We know that. But I made met a reference slightly to the fact that we heard a lot more of your story last night. Yes. And just very briefly, uh, you were actually born in a Christian home. I was. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, my biological father left when I was about two years old, but I um, had grandparents that were very into Jesus. My grandfather was actually a, a preacher. Um, he was a Marine, and my mom um, loved the Lord, of course. My whole entire family actually just loves Jesus, and yeah. I went to private Christian school, and so I, I knew about Jesus from... From the time I came out of the womb, I accepted Jesus in my heart when I was seven years old. And, um, you know, we, we, we did Jesus on a regular daily basis in our home. <laughs> you did Jesus on yes, a regular basis. I like that. More people should do that. But obviously something went wrong. Where did that start and how did that happen? Um, I was um, a rising senior in high school and had everything that you could imagine going for you. Every materialistic thing in the world I had. I had the cutest boyfriend. I had basketball scholarship offers. I had, you know, a great family that loved me, my relationship with the Lord. And um, for some reason, I began to hang out with a different crowd at school the summer before my senior year. And um, drugs began to pretty much take over my life immediately. Um, I would sit up here and lie to you if I told you I didn't like the way they made me feel because they gave me a false sense of acceptance and a false sense of everything was going to be okay and I didn't have to worry about this or that. And it just made me feel like Superwoman. But in the end, it was pretty empty. No, that's why I, I definitely said a false yeah. sense of everything was going to be okay. Um, because a, a very long story short, it pretty much took everything I had away. Um, all the materialistic things I had, they were gone instantly, um, along with my mind, along with my health, um, along with my family. Yeah. Um, it took pretty much everything away from me um, in, pre in some pretty big ways. Even uh, my, my first husband was murdered in front of me. Um, and that was a result of drugs also. So and Last night, as you were sharing with the ladies, uh, a really delicate and moving moment, you talked about how the love of your life literally was stabbed in the heart mm -hmm. and then died in your arms. Yes. And you've, you've experienced one tragedy after another. Pretty horrendous. Yeah, my, my grandma used to tell me before she died, and... She died when I was about 30 years old. She said, honey, you've been through more at 30 um, than I have my entire life, and, and you still have your whole life ahead of you. And I said, well, Mima, I guess God really just knew what it was going to take to change me. And, and I hate that, that it was some pretty life-changing, horrendous, horrible things. Um, but he's carried me through them, and right. I'm just glad that I've learned from those things and... Um, allowed him to make my life better. Right. We have a, a video clip that we want to show okay. from one of the news broadcasts about your story and your life. And this is just uh, approximately a minute long. So we're going to dim the lights and have a listen to this clip. With the city of Atlanta and the entire state of Georgia on high alert, at 2 o'clock in the morning, a 26-year-old single mom pulled up to her apartment complex in the Atlanta suburb of Duluth. Ashley Smith recalls seeing a man sitting behind the wheel of a pickup truck near the entrance to her apartment. As she unlocked her front door, Brian Nichols forced her inside at gunpoint. He then tied her up with tape and electrical cord. She recalls thinking she'd either be raped, killed, or both. And at the time, she thought she'd brought it upon herself. Smith was a years-long drug addict. Her husband was killed by a drug dealer. She'd been kicked out of her home, institutionalized, even lost custody of her daughter. And while she was tied up and held at gunpoint, she remembers telling Brian Nichols she had a stash of methamphetamine in her bedroom. He untied her. She gave him the drugs and says he snorted line after line, which ironically seemed to calm him down. Smith says the two then talked all night long. 
before we get into the actual hostage situation, they make reference to the fact that your husband had died and uh, through a drug deal, uh, well, through a fight that yes. had originated out of a life of drugs. And, um, but your family had been by your side while you tried to recover and yes. went through one type of program after another. Mm -hmm. Tell us for a moment, how relentless was your family in loving <laughs> you and trying to reach out to you? Well, for many years, my family, um, every holiday, every um, special event that we had together, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, for years, they had always accepted me into our home or in their home, um, knowing that I was going to come to the function high one way or the other. And for years, always w welcome arms, open arms, loving, you know, happy to see me. And particularly um, Christmas of 2004, um, I came, or I had knocked on my mom's door at 5 o'clock in the morning, high on ice, if you don't know, that's meth. And um, my mom called my aunt, who had custody of my daughter at the time, and my aunt called and she said, listen, just don't come this morning. We've had enough. We don't want to see you like this anymore. And I was uninvited to Christmas, and that's when I began to realize that I had a problem. Um, my family went as far as my aunt, um, shortly before this happened to me, um, she went in a Bible study one night, or one day, and her and her Bible study girls prayed, and she told me about this prayer about a week before this happened, and she said, I want you to know that the girls and I prayed today, and we prayed that if God wasn't going to change you, that he'd just take you home, and I remember being on the other end of the line saying, you prayed what? I mean, have you lost your mind? Um, and then you called me and told me about it on top of it? Um, but, you know, my aunt knew that the power of prayer was amazing. I mean, she had prayed for me for years and years, and she finally had had enough, and she was tired of what I was doing to our family. She was tired of what I was doing to my daughter, um, knowing that my daughter was on the other end of the line several times. I would tell her good night every night, praying, God, just let me have my mommy back. Yeah. Um, and my aunt knew that God was either going to change me or take me home. Now, you were about to lose custody of your daughter? I had actually already lost custody of my daughter um, 2003. Um, as a series of many things happened, uh, the cops kicked in my door. Thankfully, they didn't find anything that I got in trouble for. Um, but I got into a serious car accident as a result of hearing voices and hearing God say, let go and let God. And instead of the drugs, I let go of the steering wheel and, and pretty much died on the way to the hospital. Um, but just as a result of all of those different things, um, my life was changing. We, we have a video clip that tells us a little bit about Brian Nichols. Okay. And we're going to start to talk about the whole hostage situation. But to appreciate that part of the story, we're going to learn something about Brian Nichols himself. So again, just for a moment, we're going to dim the lights. These are actual news broadcasts that were taking place at the time. Megan, the Atlanta courthouse killer Brian Nichols was on trial for raping an ex-girlfriend, but during the trial, Nichols' current girlfriend gave birth to their son. Nichols' fear that he'd be convicted and never see his son is what legal experts believe motivated him to launch one of the most notorious attacks in Georgia history. Because Brian Nichols was deemed to be a high-risk inmate, a judge requested extra security escort him from prison to his court appearance in Atlanta. That request was either ignored or denied. Nichols was guarded by one female sheriff's deputy, and while he was changing from prison garb into courtroom attire, Brian Nichols assaulted and severely beat the deputy, knocking her unconscious, stealing her keys, and grabbing her gun from a nearby lockbox. Nichols then stormed the courtroom, shooting and killing the very judge who requested he be given extra security. A court reporter was also shot and killed, and when another deputy gave chase, Nichols turned and killed him. With the courthouse and surrounding buildings on lockdown, Brian Nichols somehow managed to make his way across two parking garages and through a citywide dragnet. Along the way, Nichols carjacked several vehicles, including a truck, 
that belonged to a federal agent who he also shot and killed. So tell us what happens right up to you having this encounter with Brian Nichols. How did he gain entrance to your apartment? Um, I was actually working two jobs at the time and going to school to be a medical assistant. assistant um, and I had worked at the local sports bar um, up until about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And I happened to see a couple of police officers sitting in the restaurant that night. And so I went up to him. I said, you know, I've seen the news today. Have y'all caught that guy? And they said, don't worry about him. He's definitely left town. He's got to be in Alabama by now. And so I went home. Um, I was supposed to visit with my daughter the next day. I just recently moved into a new apartment a couple days before that. And so I had boxes everywhere and, and was trying to get everything set away for my daughter to visit. And um, got home, unpacked everything, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, I knew it was time for bed. I went out for cigarettes, and I I went actually went to the store to get cigarettes, and I noticed a truck pulling up. Um, When I came back, I noticed that the truck had moved further to my apartment, and there was still someone sitting in it. And I'll be honest, the first, you know, my first thought was, that's a little freaky and a little weird. Um, But then I convinced myself that all the drugs I had done had permanently made me paranoid and that this man wanted nothing to do with me. And and so I got out of the car and I began to walk to the front door and I heard him get out behind me. And I heard him walking up behind me and I I walked, almost started running to my front door and I unlocked the door and when I turned around he was right behind me. He just had a gun pointed at my face and I began to scream. And he said, if you shut up I won't hurt you. And so I began to uh, prepare to do anything and everything this man to, would, you know, ask me to do um, as long as he didn't hurt me. Now, last night you were telling us how, or telling the ladies how um, you thought he was a man that God had sent. I did not know who he was life. at first. Um, when I turned around and looked at the barrel of that gun, the conversation that I had with my aunt the week prior about how my life was either going to end or change, Um, you know, it all came right there, you know, front and center, and I thought, you know what, I'm never going to change, I'm never going to get to be the mom that I kept promising Paige I would be, and deep down inside, really wanted to be, I just couldn't break free from that life, and I'm never going to get to be the Christian that I kept telling God, not now, you know, come back later, I'm having a good time with my friends. I'm partying. I'm sowing my wild oats. I'm, I'm just doing life right now, God. Just come back later. And yeah. I you know, didn't think I was going to have that opportunity. I was just going to die this lonely, widowed, drug addict mom that I had become not meaning to. So at what point did you realize he was the Brian Nichols that had now, it had become a national manhunt. Yes, it Because had. they thought he crossed state lines. Right. Mm-hmm. It was a national manhunt. We, I remember watching the news right. this, back in 2005. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how did you find out this is him? Well, he clo- um, after he told me not to scream and, and he wouldn't hurt me, he took me and grabbed me and took me inside. And we, he went to the bathroom because there was no windows or anything in there. Um, and he tied me up in the bathroom. And... He kept asking me, do you know who I am? And he had a hat pulled down over his face, and so I didn't recognize him. And then he started giving me hints and clues. I've been watching the news today, the whole Brian Nichols thing. And and then he took off his hat, and I was like, wow, that's the same mugshot from the TV. And I recognized who he was. He confirmed that was who he was. And he kept assuring me that he didn't want to hurt anybody else and that if I did everything that he told me to do, that he would not hurt me. And so I continued to do everything that he asked. In the seven hours that you were with him, this doesn't actually come up in the movie, uh, but I'm curious, did he tell you what his ultimate plan was? Well, you mean why he did what he did? Yeah, and how did he see this whole thing ending? Well, I kept asking him why, you know, why he escaped, why did you do, why did you kill those people? And And he kept giving me these kind of off-the-wall answers, like he was a soldier for his people, and the people in prison treated him so wrongly, and he had to get away from that. And, um, you know, things changed throughout the night as to what he was going to, he wanted to go to Mexico and rent this car and go get our kids. And I was like, (laughs) 
okay, whatever. Um, we were going to, or he wanted me to go along with him to rob a bank, and I'm like, I am not robbing a bank. I'm not, <laughs> you can anything else, but I, you know, I'm not getting into all of that. Right. Um, but uh, once again, you know, still knowing that here I was held gunpoint, and I could cooperate or I could die, one or the other. Um, so that, that's kind of what he was saying to me throughout the night. Now, I believe that during this event, you started to share a little bit of your own life mm -hmm. with him, and um, how did he respond? What was, what was he thinking? Um, well, you know, as we began to talk, and, you know, there, there was a point in the night where he asked me if I had any, um, any weed in the house, and as a result of trying to do everything that he said, I remembered that although I was getting my life back on track and trying to do better. I had used meth the night before, and I had put it in a place in my home that if he ransacked my room, he would find it. And so I told him I didn't have any weed, but I had meth, and I gave it to him. And he asked me three different times if I wanted to use it with him. Would you uh -huh. use this with me? Come on, use this with me. And uh, without a shadow... There, no doubt in my mind, I mean, even today as I sit up here, I know that at that moment, Jesus Christ took the body of Brian Nichols, and it wasn't Brian Nichols that was saying, come on, do these drugs with me, do you want to do these drugs? It was Jesus saying, remember that prayer your aunt prayed, do you want to live a new life, or do you want me to take you home? And um, I'm just so grateful that I saw Jesus asking me that question because for the first time in my life, I looked at Brian Nichols and I said, listen, those drugs have ruined my life. And whether I've given two minutes or 20 years to live, I never want to touch him again. And, you know, by the grace of God, I haven't done any illegal drugs since the day before he came in my life. But, you know, immediately God, I believe God gave me the eyes of Jesus and in exchange for my addiction, I got to see Brian Nichols through the eyes of Jesus. And I began to see that although he had killed four people and, you know, brutally murdered these people and, and taken a family member away, just like I had experienced many years before, he was still a sinner saved by God's grace. And, and I kind of paralleled everything. Well, he killed these people, but I chose drugs over my daughter. And, and he did this, but I did this. And, and I began to see that he was just like me, and he told me that he um, he told me that he was a Christian, but that he was fighting a spiritual warfare, and I knew all about that because I was right in the middle of spiritual warfare myself, and and we just talked back and forth about you know his family and how he had these children, and he grew up and he he had played college basketball, and he was very educated, and he had two great jobs, and and this girlfriend, you know, she. She had an affair with her pastor. It was just a bunch of conversations going back and forth, but realizing that he was a human being and that he was a, a sinner saved by grace, the same way I was. Right. Ashley, having grown up in the church and then your life falling apart the way it did, uh, on, a, on a very personal note, before you have this moment where the lights go on and you see him through Jesus' eyes, what was your opinion of God's attitude towards you? I mean, you knew better, like many of us do, and yet you stumbled and messed up. What did you think about God? Well, to be honest with you, as I stared into that barrel of the gun when he first took me hostage, I, I, I thought, this is what I deserve. Right. You know, I have played with God's mind over and over again, and yeah. I can't tell you how many times I... I said, God, I'm sorry, I, I, I did too many drugs this night. I feel like I'm going to overdose. Please mm. don't let me die, and I'll never do it again, and always ended up doing it again. Um, and so I guess as I was thinking about God, it was, you know, he, he could never love me anymore. You know, I, I, I believe Satan's lies for many years leading up to that point as I was too bad for God to love me. Satan would remind me all the time about, you know, these drugs I did, or this person that I had been with, or this or that, or every worldly bad choice that I had made, Satan always illuminated it to make me feel horrible and to make right. me feel like 
God couldn't possibly love some piece of trash like I felt like at that point in my life. Um, so I think I saw God as this unbelievable person who wouldn't pers- wouldn't possibly love me. Yeah. Um, thankfully, that that picture changed right. shortly after. And, and you know, that's such a significant point. It, it is a life-changing point because what happens is we're enticed, we're drawn away from God by issues in our own heart, mm-hmm. circumstances that we say yes to. And then we live in fear of God thinking he must hate us. And how could he ever forgive me? And what I love about this story, and so many stories that are sitting in this auditorium, is that we come to a place of brokenness. We so screw up and mess up. We're convinced that the last person that would be on our side is God. And friend, I want to tell you, if you haven't yet asked Jesus Christ into your heart, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I can sit here today and tell you categorically, both as a pastor, as a theologian, and as a human being, God never runs out of love and grace for us. The story of the prodigal son, here's God in the flesh telling the world, knowing it would be recorded in the Gospels, he's telling the world what his heart looks like. Is a dad whose son goes away bent on doing bad things. Mm -hmm. And he does. His life hits the bottom of the barrel. And the minute this father hears that his son is actually making his way back home, dad runs out to meet this kid. All those years, dad couldn't wait for his son to come home. And for every one of us, Wherever you are in life, whatever your circumstance and situation, no matter how guilt-ridden you might be, Jesus said, I haven't come to condemn the world, I've come to save the world. And the best thing we could ever do is realize we need to be saved. So here you are with Brian Nichols. At first, for the first few moments, you're thinking, okay, this is how God's going to end my life. You're offered to do drugs with him. I thought that was incredible. He's offering you to do drugs, and you're looking at him, and your life's flashing in front of you, and you made that decision not to do drugs. Well, I knew that if I was going to die, that I didn't want to have just done drugs. And, um, I mean, there was absolutely nothing. It didn't matter how bad I was. I knew that my salvation couldn't be taken away from me. I didn't know that much, but for some reason I kept believing the world that I had to look a certain way or act a certain way before I could ever step foot in a church or, you know, or be doing this or that, and that was so wrong, and I I just knew that I didn't want to meet the Lord. I wanted to at least once in my life have said no to the one thing that had ruined it, and, you know, when I laid down that ugly part of me to God is when God began to be very clear to me um, and he began to show off basically um, in my life and and he began to take control and I, I realized that there really was a miracle in process that was happening because a lot of things started to cross my mind like How did he end up in my apartment complex at the (laughs) moment I was walking out of my apartment at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night? You know, he's gotten 45 miles away from city limits. Police are everywhere. How did this happen? And I began to realize that it was nothing short of God. Yeah. He was out to get you in a good way. (laughs) He sure was. We we have a video clip we're going to show. And this video clip starts to talk about the book, The Purpose Driven yes. Life. Okay. So again, we're going to dim the lights and just go to this part of the news broadcast. Nearly a day later, thinking Brian Nichols might have crossed state lines, the manhunt was now nationwide. The media coverage nonstop. The FBI had taken the lead, but there were very few leads to follow. And the nation was baffled as to how an inmate was able to attack a secure courthouse and then simply run away. 
But 15 miles from that courthouse, Ashley Smith and the most wanted man in the country continued talking. And as morning rolled around, Smith recalls cooking pancakes, asking Brian Nichols if she could read him part of a book she'd been given. Pastor Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. At first, she says Nichols dismissed it as church BS, but then she read aloud chapter 32, using what God gave you, including the line, quote, what you are is God's gift to you. What you do with yourself is your gift to God. Okay, so maybe it was 15 miles away and not 45, but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, it's still the same. Still a miracle, right? Exactly. <laughs> and who's to say he's right exactly, anyway? Exactly, that's right. Yeah, my money's on you, girl. <laughs> Ashley, your family was praying for you a lot. Yes. And you and I were talking a little bit in the car about the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely convinced it's all of their praying and their intercession that got you through one disaster situation after another. Is that correct? My aunt prayed for me for over five years, and she never, you know, never ceased. Yeah. And you know, even being a product of prayer, I, I told you this this morning, even being a product of prayer and knowing that my life is here today because of prayer, um, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around how easy and how powerful prayer is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. People say, well, what do I do in this situation? I'm like, I know this sounds childish, and I know it seems so easy, but just pray. Mm -hmm. And if the whole world just prayed, then we'd be in a so totally different place. Because yeah. you said, you know, it, it, it totally in the car, I was just like, wow, Satan gets us so busy to where we don't even do the one thing that's so easy and right. it's just pray. Yeah. We just forget to do it or we think, oh, well, I can say I'm praying for you and, and just kind of brush it off in my head. But if you really stop for 10 seconds and pray for that person and do that one thing, it's so massive. Absolutely. And I had people that still come up to me to this day. It might happen today. It might happen at my next event that it will say, when we heard that there was somebody held hostage, I felt deep down in my soul that it was a Christian woman, and I began to pray for you. And so I don't know how many of those prayers sure. saved my life that night, sure. too. Absolutely. You know, in this church, we, we really make prayer a tremendous foundation. That's why next week we show the movie War Room, mm -hmm. and then for four weeks after that, we have a video Bible study on prayer. But I'm going to tell you that prayer... Again, it's not the power of prayer, but it's the power of God when we talk to him right. in prayer. Yes. And in the car, like you said, you know, you said it, it should be, it's one of the easiest things to do, and yet we don't do it. Right. And that's because Satan and his kingdom understands the power and the dynamics that get released when we start to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, church. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in the heavens, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in the heavens. You have been given, we have been given that kind of prayer authority from Jesus Christ himself. And so Satan, if there's one thing he wants to stop church people from doing, that is to pray. And he will press on every fleshly part of us to sidetrack us, distract us, not get us to a prayer meeting, because prayer is a thing that when we talk to God, it will revolutionize earth because heaven starts to get engaged in our day-to-day -day life. Well, if it wasn't so important, God wouldn't wasted the few lines that are in the Bible that we should pray without ceasing. Absolutely. I mean, he spent... Those words, I mean, that space in his book of our life instructions to say, pray without seat, don't stop. Yeah. And yet we don't do it yeah. often. We, 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 we see so many miracles here, not just healings, but supernatural interventions. And without a question, we put it down first to the fact that God loves us and God wants to do good things. And secondly, we put it down to prayer with faith. Faith-filled prayers releases the will of God. You know, Jesus' disciples, they're watching him. 
They're following him and they're watching him do all this amazing stuff. And finally, they say, yo, you got to teach us how to do this. Teach us how to pray. Listen to me. You're not ordinary. If you've asked Jesus Christ in your heart, heaven lives inside of you. The greatest power in the universe is summed up in that name of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't asked him in your heart, in a moment we're going to give you that opportunity. But when Jesus comes and lives inside of you and you start to pray, believing that God loves you and cares about you, let me tell you, you have the key to unlock the door to supernatural intervention. God doesn't just do the natural, He does the supernatural. And we believe, we believe, we believe, and I encourage you to believe God wants to do a miracle in your life as well. Hey, anyone out there agree? Amen. Come on, put your hands together if you agree. Absolutely. So you start reading this book, Purpose Driven Life, to Brian Nichols, and he's listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at one point he asked you, correct me if I'm wrong, what do you think God's purpose is for my life? Yes. Well, um, it's important that you I know I acquired the Purpose Driven Life um, a couple weeks before um, at a church service that I went to for the first time in years. And on the front of that book, it says, what on earth are we here for? And I picked that book up because I knew that I needed that question answered in my life. Because everything that I had ever defined myself as, I wasn't anymore. I, I wasn't acting like a Christian. I wasn't a wife anymore. I wasn't a mother anymore. I wasn't anything. And so I took that book home and I began to read it. And God began to show off in my life over those next 32 days. And when Brian Nichols came into my life and I chose not to do the drugs, instead of, I, I knew that I needed something to back my decision up. And so I went and I got my Purpose Driven Life because I remembered I hadn't read my chapter for the day. And I asked Brian Nichols if I could read, and he said, only if you read it out loud. And I happened to be on chapter 32 where it talks about using God in your shape that he has for you. And when he and I were talking, I had already shared with him that my husband had been murdered and, and several different things. And I don't know, I guess through the power of Jesus, he began to see some strength in me. And he said, um, you know, I think you should share your life with other people. What do you think I should do with mine? And I said, well, you know, you've made a bad choice. You've killed four people. And you're going to have to pay for what you did. Maybe you're supposed to minister to people in prison because people in prison need Jesus too. Now, I know that 110% because... I'm married to a convicted felon, and I know that's where he met Jesus, and I know that people in prison need Jesus also. Right. But he kept telling me, they're going to kill me for what I did. I'm not going to get that opportunity. I said, well, you don't know what Jesus has for you. And as the story goes, he did not get the death penalty. He got life in prison. 280 years and six life sentences later, he's spending the rest of his life in prison. And so he has the opportunity to minister to people in prison. This in itself is, is an amazing miracle because here's a guy, whatever demonic forces were around him, he just, just had killed four human lives. Yes. And he's sitting with you for seven hours. Here you are, you've been using drugs, desperately trying to get straight. God comes into the middle of the most unlikely, the most ungodly, the un, most unchurched place. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of a recent murderer and a struggling drug user, God shows up and this man's heart starts to soften. He was in for aggravated rape. If he surrenders, he's looking at sentences for four lives. He's going to be serving life terms longer than he'll ever live. And yet the Spirit of God touched his heart and he surrendered. Tell us about that because we, we actually have a clip of the 911 call. 
and uh, you had to, you were supposed to meet your aunt and yes. your daughter that morning. Right. What happened that you were allowed to be set free? Well, um, all night long, I kept telling him I'm supposed to meet my little girl tomorrow. He had already told me that he had children, and I said, I haven't seen her in several weeks. Imagine the way she's going to feel when I don't show up. And I said, my family's going to worry about where I am. They're going to wonder where I am. Because even though I'm a drug user and even though it controls my life, I would never miss a meeting with my daughter unless something was seriously wrong. So they'll come looking for me. And for most of the night, he told me I wasn't going to be able to go. But about 8 o'clock the next morning, somewhere around there, he just looked at me and he said, what time do you need to leave to see your little girl? You know, I jokingly looked at my watch, and I was like, now? Now would be a great time for me to just get out of here. Um, and and he, he just let me go. He said, will you please tell Paige I said hello? And I was like, sure, yeah, I'll tell her. Um, he gave me some money that he had stolen the night before, and he said, you might need this, and then he gave me the battery to my cell phone that he had taken out, and he said, here you go. Now I just left. You left. When you left, I mean, he knew you. He must have known. I don't know. I've, I've, I've asked myself that question several times because he said to me also, is there anything I can do for you while you're gone? And I'm thinking, while I'm gone, I mean, I'm not coming back, okay? You do know that, right? But sure, go ahead. You can hang this mirror. That needs to be done. I Whatever you want. He, he actually hung the mirror. Like when the police came in, and I did one walkthrough through that apartment after that happened and never went back. Matter of fact, my mom moved me out of that apartment. I was several hours away. I didn't want to have any part in it. And he hung the mirror. Um but he let me go, and I called 911 and told him that I was going to see my daughter, and they said, oh, no, you're going to go back to the apartment. I said, no, I am not. They told me to meet him in a safe place, and they didn't believe me at first that it was him. It took several, probably 35 minutes, because I had to prove to him, to them, that he was inside by showing them a truck that he had stolen and all of that, and and several, you know, about an hour later, actually, with helicopters and armored trucks and you know, everything, wow. Wow. he comes out with his hands up. We're going to go to the clip, okay. and this includes the 911 call. Nichols then asked what Ashley Smith thought his purpose was. She said to go to jail, pay for what he did, and try to minister people in prison. Smith then told Brian Nichols she had to leave to see her daughter. To her amazement, he let her go. She immediately called 911. First she got two busy signals, then she finally got through. The victim is advising that he is in the apartment at this time. There are three weapons underneath the bed. She's advising he's wanting to turn himself in. Heavily armed officers have now cordoned off the apartment complex. They've got their guns drawn. We've seen a sniper team. Authorities surrounded the apartment. Brian Nichols surrendered peacefully. Sweetheart, God used you to preach to that guy for seven hours. I guarantee if he was sitting in the church, he wouldn't have sat there for seven hours. Yeah, true. <laughs> this is part of the miracle, that God used you in your broken state. God can use every one of us, even in our broken state. It is so important to share about how awesome God is and that he's a God that gives us hope mm -hmm. and the opportunity to have a changed life. Yes. So this man surrenders, no fight, no more bloodshed, gives himself in, and uh, you were totally involved in that. It's kind of hard to, to think about, and that's one of the things that I've struggled with, you know, over the... I'm getting better at it now because I, I realize why God allowed it to happen, but for the first couple of years, it was hard for me to realize how this lonely widow drug addict mom who probably deserved death um, who whose life was spared as opposed to 
this well-respected judge that people loved, mm. this court reporter who baked cookies for the courtroom every week, you know, this police officer who probably knew he, as he was chasing this man that he might die, and yet he still 110% was going to catch him. And then the court reporter who was just minding his own business, working on his house, and Brian Nichols comes in to steal his truck, and and once again he he protects his country and tries to to you know get this man to turn himself in. Or um, it was a struggle, and my family prayed over me, and I I kept saying, God, why? What do you want me to do with this? I mean, for goodness' sake, Oprah Winfrey is calling the house, and Larry King, and and they're wanting to write a book about my life and do a movie and. And that's flattering and all, but I need to not miss what the big picture is here. And God kept telling me that I just want you to tell the world I changed you. That's all I want you to do. Because in my apartment that night, Ashley Smith didn't do anything great and wonderful. I just happened to give my life back to Jesus and start trying to fall in love with the one person that literally reached down into the pits of hell that my life had become. I mean, I was beating on hell's gate saying, let me in, you know, I'm ready, let me come in. And God was saying, absolutely not. You are not his, you are mine, and I'm taking you from this. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's incredible.